so I won't say more other than to thank again David for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, James. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here today at Sussex University. Um, and it's great to see you all, so many of you here as well, to, uh, to hear something about the JRC. Um, what I would like to do, actually, is just give you a bit of background on the JRC and what's been going on there in the last you know, two or three years. But then sort of stand back again and look, sort of remind you a bit on what are the big challenges facing humanity today and then why we, go, why we need to have science-based regulations in the markets that are operating, taking into account th those challenges and how they're affecting us. And then from that I'll derive a little bit some of the key priorities of the JRC in Horizon 2020. You might know that Horizon 2020, although um, of the 80 or so, well, depending on which accounting system you use, of the 80 or so billion euros available, which is put out for laboratories and research organisations in the member states to bid for, there's around about 2 billion, which actually comes direct to the JRC and over the seven-year period, that is, and which therefore is funding the work that we're doing to support the, policy, the, the science for policy process that's basically our mission. But let me, let me start again then with the overview of the JRC. And I can tell you that uh, we had a visit from uh, Jose Manuel Barroso to our laboratories in ISPRA uh, at the beginning of last year. And it's very clear that at the highest level in the Commission, there is a very strong commitment to research and innovation. There is strong belief at all, from the top and right uh, throughout the Commission, that the way forward for European society is to invest more in science and innovation and that way we will develop, uh, increase the well-being of our citizens and of course our economic uh, capacity. So that's a, a, a well-established thing and it seems to be pretty much the view in all member states. And the, in spite of the recent economic crisis, uh, the funding for research and innovation seems to be pretty well protected. Our own commissioner, Moira Gagan Quinn, who of course is the Irish commissioner in the commission, uh, and is who is responsible for the Joint Research Centre, um, said when she started, about four years ago now, that she would like to put JRC at the heart of the EU policy process. Um, the, for, since 98, the JRC's mission has been to support um, policy making, provide the science to support policy making, but we've, she, her vision, and this followed a little bit the King Report, which was the ex post assessment on framework six uh, of the JRC, was that the, the JRC should move nearer to the centre of the policy process and adv provide direct advice at the highest level to the director generals, really, inside the Commission, responsible for policy. And in fact, there you can see in her quote, Moira Gagan Quinn, JRC should really be the real brain of the European Commission. That was what she actually said. So that gave a, a kind of a, a flavour of what she was thinking. And then not long after she was appointed, uh, she uh, in turn appointed Dominic Ristori to be our Director General. Um, and he uh, coined the phrase that the JRC uh, is the Commission's in-house science service. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. The JRC supports EU policymakers in the conception, development, implementation and monitoring of EU policy. In fact, we just heard um, only uh, the day before yesterday that, in fact, our Director General, Dominic Ristori, will be moving soon to become the Director General of DG Energy, 
which of course is one of the most important policy DGs in the Commission. Uh, so that's a good reflection, I think, um, on him and on the importance of the, of the, of the JRC itself in, um, in, in helping with the, energy, uh, with, the, with the policy formulation process. Just a few facts, in fact. The, the JRC has been going since 1957. Uh, we were set up under the Euratom Treaty at that time to help develop the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And our mission, of course, has completely changed in the time that we've been going, although we've still got the same name, JRC. I don't like the name at all. It doesn't reflect what we do. We're not joint, we're not, we don't do research, and we're not a centre. Um, <laughs> but apart from that, it's, 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 it, it's stuck. Um, so that's why I like to talk about the Commission's in-house science service, because that's really, that really does describe, I think, what, what we're aiming to do. And in fact, we're the only Commission Directorate General that carries out direct research in the sense that our own staff do hands-on scientific activity, um, including in laboratories as well as uh, 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 computers and so on. And that's, that's any, all other directorates general. Of course, they formulate policies and they look at scientific information in the formulation of policies. Or they manage the research process, which is actually executed in the member states. We're the only part of the commission that has hands-on scientists working in the DG. In fact, we're based in seven different institutes in five member countries. You see on this graph... And the biggest part actually is in ISPRA, um, where we have the Institute for Protection and Security of the Citizen, um, the Institute for Energy, uh, for Environment and uh, Sustainability, uh, and the Institute for Health and Consumer Protection, uh, plus part of the Institute for uh, Energy and Transport. Um, <coughs> you, as was James already said, you're probably also familiar with our, our institute in Seville the Institute for Prospective Technological Studies. <coughs> Overall, uh, the figure, which I think is the exact number on the 31st of December 2012, is 2,822 staff, and 35% of those are short-term staff, mainly postdocs. So a lot of our work is actually done by postdocs coming from... Uh, uh, organisations in the member states and then after <coughs> typically a maximum of three years going back uh, to work where they came from. And that flux in and out of young scientific staff is in fact crucial to the operations of the JRC because it's bringing all the time new ideas straight from the scientific um, uh, research organisations and universities of Europe. Um, just to give you an idea, uh, during 2012, the JRC actually supported over 1,200 or produced 1,200 different specific outputs, some huge, some very small, but, you know, if you're trying to count them, well, the number turns out to be 1,213 specific deliverables into the policy process. And although this is not our raison d'etre, it's important that we... And, and you'll see that we also produced something like 630 peer-reviewed articles in 2012. And our policy is to publish all our work as uh, in the scientific literature, because that establishes the solid scientific credibility uh, of the organisation. Um, and uh, it's, so if you, if you think of it as a, as a kind of a spin-off, our job is to produce the advice to the policymaker, and therefore the 1,213 policy support deliverables, but the spin-off uh, is the 630 or so peer-reviewed scientific publications. Um, but it's an essential part because it's only because we are well established and um, well understood by the scientific community that the policymakers can be sure that the advice we're giving them is, 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 is well founded in good science. And our budget for 2013, something like 350 million euros altogether, plus another 62 million of earned income, which comes from all kinds of different 
uh, sources, which I won't go through right now. So if you, to sum up a bit, the JRC has three particular factors. I mean, first of all, our job is to provide EU policies with independent, evidence-based scientific and technical support throughout the whole policy cycle. Um, that essentially, that support goes to the policy DGs inside the Commission. I mean, we also produce information, for example, for the European Parliament to help them in their stage in the formulation of policy. But our main customers are policy DGs inside the Commission that are responsible for preparing the policy proposals and then following up on the implementation of policies. To do that, we work very closely in cooperation with Commission services, with member states, industry uh, throughout the EU and indeed internationally. And, I mean, I, I use the word independent there, but what do I mean by independent? I mean we're independent of industrial or national interests. And for, in, in many cases, that's very important because if the Commission is going to produce policy proposals based on science, it's got to be visible to everybody that that scientific evidence is not biased by any particular interest. And, of course, you'll be familiar uh, in the UK context with that from the point of view of industrial interest. But when we get to the level of the EU, we have to make sure it doesn't favour any one member state in, uh, to the advantage of another one. So that's why we're part of the Commission, because that's the only place where you can put an organisation that is, is and is seen to be independent of both industrial or national interest. We also, of course, have access to uh, or, or confidential information that the Commission has, but which is not necessarily publicly available. And we're able, because we're basically Commission staff, to provide on tap, fast, flexible response to new demands as they arise. Now, James mentioned earlier on that we're changing quite dramatically in the JRC. We've moved on over the last three years quite a lot. And indeed, part of that is building up the competence in Brussels because it's there from Brussels that we have day-to-day -day interactions with the policy DGs. Um, and you can see a number of areas. So we're doing more on horizon scan and foresight. That's the idea of anticipating to the future what's going to change um, and making sure, therefore, that we're ahead of the game. We're thinking about what are the scientific issues that are going to be important in the future in EU policy making, and making sure we're up to, to speed on those. We're looking more at policy options. I mean, instead of saying the, the Commission has a bit of a tradition of saying, this is the policy, now let's look for the evidence that supports it, we want to move away from that and say, this is the problem, what are the options for solving that problem? What are the policy options for solving the problem? And then do, if you like, analyses of those options. What are the benefits? What are the pros and cons of all the different options? So the policymaker can choose between them. We're moving very much towards economics. I mean, the, the JRC traditionally, I mentioned its long, uh, its original nuclear background. So based on physical sciences, more recently we branched out towards also life sciences as well as physics and chemistry, but now with economics and social sciences, <coughs> ma most of these policy questions, there's an enormously important social science element. So we're really trying to build up the social science uh, capacity inside the JRC, and to start that, we, we want to work more with university expertise in the, in the social sciences. Economic modelling, uh, again, developing fast, and also our role in the standardisation process. Now, that's, a, that's a sort of the end of the introduction on what's happening in the JRC. Now I'd like to just tell you a little bit about how we're developing our priorities for the future. And as I said at the beginning, I'd like to stand back and just look at some of the things that are changing in the world and what um, and you know how those are affecting our thinking. 
And of course, you'll have seen all this before. None of this is new, but I just want to remind you of three or three and a, three and point five rapid changes that are going on. I mean, obviously, the first one is the population of the planet. Um, you can see there. I mean, the, the, most most um, people now say that we expect the population to peak at around nine billion in 2050. That seems to be the most likely estimate. Although, if you look at those three UN uh, options, in fact, um, one of them peaks at a bit less than that before 2050. Another one goes up to nearly over 10. And then the other one heads up crazily towards 16 billion. I, I suppose that one's not so likely. But the, the general feeling is that we're heading for a planet with 9 billion people around 2050. Of course, the EU, which looks higher there because of the way we've put it on with a different scale on the other side of the graph, a fact, of course, is only a, a small fraction of the world population and going down from a, well, depending on which scenario you look at, probably maybe going down from more or less now on. Interestingly, if the EU population over the last 10 years has actually, not because of expansion of the EU, if you take the 20 uh, eight countries that make up the EU today, their population altogether has gone up by about 10 million from 490 to 500 million. But when you look at the demographics, all of those 10 million are in the over 65 category. There are no more young people uh, in the up to 25 or in the 25 to 65 categories. And in fact, well, I, I'll come back to that in a minute. The, uh, you see here energy consumption. I mean, energy is one of the indicators, but obviously it's, it goes up even more than population because developing countries, increasing lifestyles and so on, means that energy uh, consumption is actually going up faster than population. World trade as a percentage of GDP is now over 50% worldwide. And globalization is a key pressure uh, on Europe today. Um, it affects everything we do, and it's changed our way of thinking dramatically, really, since even the beginning of this millennium. It's going on rising, uh, and although there's a little bit of a dip there co corresponding to the recession, we don't see that dip uh, being very long, and it will continue to go upwards. And then life expectancy, I already mentioned it, and the proportion of people over 65 in the population in the world going up, but very dramatically so in Europe. So, um, you know, though I think those are the three big trends uh, and we have to start with those trends and work out then in the EU what it is we're going to try and um, establish for our future based on, on, on what's going on. And, and the way I see it then, the EU has to sort of play a role in the global issue. And here I've tried to write it down in not too many words, I mean, to provide sufficient food, energy, and water for the world's increasing population, whilst also mitigating and adapting to climate change and reducing fossil fuel use, managing increased urbanization and changing lifestyles. So that's what, if you like, that's what's going on in the world. And while at the same time what's going on in the EU is that we have to create economic growth and jobs now, uh, manage this changing demographic situation, and indeed provide for stable financial management, which is a particular feature of the Eurozone. It doesn't affect so much the UK, except that if, of course, the Eurozone doesn't work, then the UK will have big problems. So, and if you look at these two challenges, in some ways they are not always, but in some ways they are conflicting because our desire to um, ensure that we have 
the long-term sustainability of the planet doesn't necessarily agree with the fact that with youth unemployment in some of our countries in the EU over 50%, we've got to do something immediately now to create jobs. So how do we balance those two challenges? I mean, that, that, that's the real issue that we've been facing. And it's been drawn sharply into focus during the current economic crisis. And while, you know, the good news is that here in the UK, we seem to be emerging from that crisis, the fact is that the two things are still there and they don't necessarily support one another. In other European countries, you know, we're still in sharp, we, we still have sharp economic difficulties today. And it's balancing those two things that's the, the problem. And, and, and that this is why I argue we need to have science-based regulations and standards. <coughs> and if I... I'm allowed a bit of a diversion. It's, it, it may be obvious to, to most of you, but I still think we should spell it out because you hear so many things in the press these days. So I'd just like to sort of spell out, first of all, why do we need regulations at all to make the economics of the marketplace work? Uh, secondly, why I think that those need to be at European level, if not better, even better at global level. And then thirdly, why I think the only way of getting there is to have more science underpinning those standards. And, you know, on the first point, I mean, industry works extremely well, but it needs a level playing field to work on. I mean, if you read the CBI uh, recent reports coming out of the CBI conference, industry is clear that they need to have a level playing field. If, you, if, if, if they're not provided with that by the rules of the market, then they can't really compete sensibly because what happens is the person that takes the shortest term, the industry that takes the shortest term view, always wins out and wipes out the others before the long term view uh, can come in. So if you've got to balance sustainability against short term economic growth, then you've got to have regulations. And the only people that can set those regulations are society. And that, in our, demographic system, in our democratic system, means the political system. Now, why do, why do those regula regulations have to be set at European level? I mean, in, in principle, any market can set its own regulations. Um, so the UK, for example, can easily say that any car sold in the UK must have a speedometer in miles per hour. Perfect. It's a low cost thing, it's easy to introduce, it works very well. But if you start now to say, talk about, for example, the efficiency of the vehicle engines, and in particular the CO2 emissions from vehicle engines, there are two reasons for making those at, the, at the, the biggest possible markets that you can get to. I mean, the, the first reason is that industry, it's cheaper for industry to make one kind of engine and sell it to, 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 sell it to the whole world rather than different engines for the different parts of the market. So that's, and industry are, are clear about that. That's why they would like, that's why they argue strongly to have an EU and to move towards trade agreements with the US and other markets. But the other argument is that if we're going to tackle things like climate change, it only works if we can have a global approach. So we, we need to find a, a, a system where we can somehow agree that the CO2 emissions from a car should be at a particular level, because there's no point in Europe doing something if the rest of the world's got a different plan for its CO2 emissions from cars. So now, at the moment, we don't have global standards, and we don't have a mechanism for, for, <coughs> for providing those global standards. But my argument is that the best way of getting there is to have an EU with its 28 member states that at least is clear about its own standards, and then argues about those standards in international arenas. 
based on the, the huge size of our EU market and indeed our um, industrial capacity. So it's, I would love it if we could move towards <laughs> global regulations to some of these issues. We're not there yet, but in the meantime, the EU's the best thing we've got on the table. So we need to keep those EU standards. And then thirdly, why are they science-based? Well, I, I think the key point there is that we have to optimise... I mean, in the end, only politicians can choose the final <coughs> balance between sustainability and economic and, and short-term growth. It's a political thing, it's a social pact, and politicians have that difficult responsibility. It's very, it's not easy, but I think the more we can give them the hard scientific information where it exists, the, the easier we make it for them. And, that, and, and that's our responsibility as scientists. And if you take, for example, coming back to the specific case of the, the CO2 emissions from cars, it turns out when you look at the, um, the fuel savings, the, the money saved in fuel savings over the lifetime of a car, which is sort of 10 to 15 years, is not enough yet to pay for the extra cost of the engine to make it more fuel efficient. So there has to be a desire of society, not just the simple consumer, there has to be a desire of society to reduce the CO2 emissions. So if you can work out a curve, a graph if you like, showing what is the, co the extra cost versus the fuel efficiency and, the CO and therefore the CO2 emissions, then you can choose the point where you get the optimum balance between sustainability and economic growth. And that's, that's what our job is, to try and provide that basis. And, and so I, I strongly argue that we need science in the, in the uh, regulatory process. And there's so much noise coming from all directions, from different protagonists, which, which is based on either um, uh, sort of emotional feeling about issues or industrial views about the way they would like things to go. So you, we need to, to maintain and strengthen the, the overall scientific capability going into advice on those policies. I won't go through that slide in detail because we'll be here all day, but let me just try. I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to speed up dramatically now. You'll see, therefore, that, that what we've come out with as the six priorities for the JRC for these next two years and leading in towards Horizon 2020 are, in fact, these six here. Agriculture and global food security, low carbon economy and resource efficiency, and in particular energy, climate change, energy, uh, environment, climate change, energy, and transport. And those are really global issues. And then coming on to single internal market growth, jobs, and innovation in the EU, public health, safety, and security, economic and monetary union, and nuclear safety and security. And if you go, you'll see some of the key points that come out. I mean, on, on agriculture and food security, new plant breeding techniques, crucial issue. Um, the, 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 the current generation of GMOs uh, are now being replaced with some new techniques which essentially, um, which are essentially different in terms of the, 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 the technical way they work. Um, and I think it's very important that we have the right communication to the consumer and society as a whole on the difference between these techniques and some of the things they didn't like about the first generation of GMOs. Um, because we, we've got to um, uh, ensure that we don't make a big mistake on this uh, in Europe uh, and have a swing against them based on, a, uh, based on incorrect uh, information going out to the public. Land availability and soil quality, um, impact on, of climate on agriculture <coughs> and vice versa, of course, a crucial issue. 
uh, effect of extreme weather on, on, on agriculture, better valorization of ocean resources. We, can we feed the planet only using the land we have available? Possibly, possibly not. And future price trends and volatility in the food area. Low carbon economy and resource efficiency. Biofuels, of course, central issue. Uh, and indirect land use change, which is debated uh, uh, now very much in the, at the EU level. Shale gas, um, potential, m potential in, uh, uh, market and economic uh, environmental impact. Um, best available techniques for energy efficient industries, iron, steel, glass and cement. Uh, interoperability for electromobility and smart grids. I mean, we, when it comes to the future electric car, which maybe is only, possibly is only relevant for sh short distance urban transport, making it actually work with the grid is a crucial issue. Standards for energy efficiency, particularly in homes and other buildings in Europe, and water, safeguarding European waters and and I mean fresh water it be, is becoming more and more of a key issue globally um, then the whole question of the single market um, and here there's uh, more work going into measuring the how we ensure that the research base of Europe is converted into business opportunities um, we've got the, one of the m amongst the best uh, research c capacities in the world, but are we actually doing as much as we should in getting that um, capability usable to create jobs in industry? Eco industries, and here of course is a big opportunity because we line up the two challenges. This can create jobs now while uh, solving the environmental sustainability prob problems of the future. Standards for the construction sector uh, and connecting European science and business. Public health, safety and security. Um, and in particular, the whole demographic era, uh, issue and how we're going to achieve affordable health care for European Union citizens. Um, you'll be familiar in Britain as pretty much all other countries with the accident and emergency crisis. Um, and basically our population is getting older and frailer. Uh, our life expectancy is going up. But are we getting more healthy years? And how are we looking after and at what cost of the older people? So this is, this is, this is really starting to get... You know, in these next years, this is going to be the big issue uh, here within Europe. Uh, cancer screening, standards for medical devices, um, different subject nanomaterials uh, and the safety in, in, in different products. Um, uh, droughts, fires and floods on the security uh, issue. The, the, this is getting worse worldwide, but not least here in Europe. Then finally, uh, well not quite finally because I've still got the nuclear one to look at, um, EMU. Um, this is something you don't hear too much about uh, in Britain, but making the Eurozone work. Now you might think, well what's that got to do with an organisation like the JRC? But in fact, the economic modelling of the financial system that we're doing is being used by the Commission to test out all their proposed policies for the banking union, um, which essentially will underpin the financial stability. Because what we don't, we don't want to happen again next time there's a financial downturn worldwide for the euro to go into chaos mode. So we need a better financial system inside the eurozone um, more equivalent if you like to the financial system that we already have inside the uk how that will work if scotland 
becomes independent from the rest of the UK, I don't know. But, the, but uh, in any case, some kind of um, uh, underpinning um, financial stability framework. And then finally, nuclear. Now, in fact, I mentioned at the start that the JRC started off entirely as a nuclear organisation. But still, safety and security of nuclear reactors remains an important issue for us. Our energy uh, production in Europe depends crucially uh, on nuclear, and we won't go away from that any time very soon. As you know, the Germans have taken a decision to close down all their nuclear reactors uh, uh, relatively in, in the short term, and they're now really struggling with how they're going to move away from that without using a lot more coal. Um, probably their initial reaction has had to be to use more coal, but that, that's, of course, going backwards in terms of the climate um, aims. Um, you know, shale gas might provide something of, a, of, a, of a, an intermediate gap there, but for the rest of Europe, we are going to maintain nuclear. The UK have announced now to go ahead with the nuclear, um, the additional new nuclear plant. We, we in the JRC maintain at European level the competence on safety and security of nuclear reactors aimed, to, and not just the reactors themselves, but the whole nuclear system, including all aspects of the fuel cycle. Um, because the Commission has a responsibility to give an opinion on all nuclear activities going on inside the EU. Um, so we have our hands-on capability in nuclear, which is crucial to maintaining that. And we also, of course, probably you may not know, but the stress tests carried out on all European reactors following Fukushima was done by the member states. But then the JRC actually did a peer review or organised a peer review at EU level of those stress tests uh, so that everybody in the EU is confident that the stress tests carried out in all the member states were done in the same way and with the same confidence of reaction. It's very important this because if we had a, uh, an, a, a nuclear accident in Europe, it would cause a massive economic, well, possibly worse, but it, a, at least a massive economic problem uh, to us. So um, let me just finish off. The JRC, you've seen our mission. We do it by maintaining a scientific capability. We, uh, we, you can't do this job just as a kind of consultancy group. You need to have hands-on scientific capability in the key areas. That means working with the best organisations in Europe and indeed throughout the world. We also do some exploratory research because we need, as, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to be ahead of our policy DG customers. It's no good waiting for them to come and ask us something. We need to understand the problems before they realise they are problems and warn them that they're coming. Uh, and finally, we're networking uh, extensively. We have a, about a thousand different partners in universities, typically, and other research organisations. Um, more recently, we've also started working with the European uh, um, uh, uh, Science Advisory, uh, Science um, uh, councils, uh, of which the Royal Society is the UK member, the Leopoldina from Germany and so on, ESAC, and Eurocase, which is the European uh, uh, Engineering Academies. And then finally, in the last year, we've set up the European Forum for Science and Industry. This has something like, well, 800, it's the current count, industrial members, uh, mainly industrial, but also from scientific organisations, um, and other organisations, including universities. So this is a kind of where we the forum organises events on different topics from time to time, specific topics, and we organise 
um, uh, roundtables, newsletters, and so on. So trying to draw in at European level, on the business side and the science side, different partners to exchange information and ensure the maximum flow and discussion of ideas. So that was everything I was going to say. I'm very happy to try and answer uh, any questions. I hope I've managed to stay roughly within the, within the time scale. So uh, back to you, James. <laughs>